It's the Adam Ragusea podcast, episode 28. This is a speech that I gave to a conference of young professionals organized by the Chamber of Commerce in Knoxville, Tennessee, where I live. The speech is called Champagne Problems. It's all about the bad things that happen and really just a few weird things that happen when all of your dreams come true, which they might, so listen up. So, uh... Most people in the audience, I I think I know something about you. I think I know that you have chosen to attend a conference for young professionals in the middle of the day, organized by the Chamber of Commerce, and that tells me that you are probably ambitious, like you're you're a gunner. You really want to make it whatever it is to you. Am I right about that? I said, am I right about that? There it is. Well... I stand here before you uh, a specimen of a human who has very recently made it. Uh, a few years ago, I had, a, I had a good career. I had a solid you know, university salary. Um, but I had very little control over my own destiny and almost no money in the bank. Kids, you know. Today, I, I own my own company with my wife. We work for ourselves. We work as much or as little as we want to. We have a fair bit of money in the bank. I spend my days following my own curiosity and my creative impulse wherever they they lead me. I make whatever things I want to make and literally millions of people all over the world gobble up my wares gratefully. I sit on the side of the river that y'all are trying to reach. So I intend now to give you some idea of what it's actually like over here and thereby help you to develop a mental image of what success might actually look like for you so that you can know what to expect if you actually get where you're trying to go by being in this room right now. It's mostly good over here on this side of the the river of struggle. (laughs) Definitely better than on the other side. I have no intention of ever going back to the other side if I can avoid it, but uh, Over here on the better side, things are not perfect. These are problems that one might rightfully characterize as champagne problems. But they are problems nonetheless, and I will describe four of them for you now. I'm not trying to gin up sympathy for all of those those poor rich folks, all those atlases laboring under their globes. Rather, I will describe these four champagne problems so that you might be better prepared if you achieve the success that you are trying to achieve by being here today. So, champagne problem number one, you're still stuck with yourself. Success changes your circumstances far more than it changes you. You can buy yourself one of those big mansions up on uh, Lions View Pike, overlooking the river, you know what I'm talking about? You could buy one, you could tear it down, build a nicer one, as I believe someone is doing right now, behind one of those tall stone walls. You can buy one of those, but I regret to inform you that you'll still be the one living in it. And all of your endogenic problems will remain with you. Well, what does that mean? Well, there is a large and growing volume of scientific literature on the topic of happiness. What makes people truly happy? To study this, scientists look at self-reported data, of course. You know, you ask people how happy they are and what they think makes them happy. But you certainly do not stop your investigation there, because people are very often wrong about what they think makes them happy. A pathological gambler thinks that one more spin of that wheel will make them happy, and they are wrong about that. A pathological eater thinks that slamming an entire pizza will make them happy, and it it may in the very short term, but in the long term, not so much, and I may speak from experience on that one. Scientists look at endogenic versus exogenic causes of happiness. Exogenic causes are things that happen to you. Endogenic are the things that happen within you. Having a YouTube video randomly go viral almost four years ago now, and all of the good feelings that stroke of luck has brought me, that's all exogenic, arguably exogenic. Because even if you get a break, you get a stroke of luck, 
you still have to dig deep inside yourself to capitalize on that luck, unless you are very, very, very lucky, unless you, say, inherit hundreds of millions of dollars from a parent. In that event, it's possible to do just about everything wrong from that point forward and remain very wealthy and powerful. You don't have to play the game all that well if you start with a really full health bar. But the kind of luck that uh, you can more realistically hope for is the kind of luck you have to actively capitalize on. And it's the kind of luck that you have to help make. My stroke of luck did not come out of nowhere. I first had to make a good video about how to make pizza that a lot of people might want to watch and share. I spent the whole first half of my life developing the skills that would ultimately allow me to make such a video and to then make hundreds more such videos, though I certainly had no idea that this particular thing is what I was working toward that whole time. I was a music major. How about you? Success particularly success based on fame, is highly unpredictable. You can create the conditions for success, like you can create the conditions for a good sourdough starter, but what microorganisms ultimately colonize your starter, that is exogenic. Anyway, happiness research. Happiness research. One of the things that scientists look at to quantify happiness is certain biomarkers. Dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, those are all neurotransmitters positively associated with happiness. Cortisol, adrenaline, hormones negatively correlated with happiness, though of course those are crude generalities. I can think of a few activities that spike my adrenaline that I also, I think, make me happy, but anyway. There's a, there's a well-known 2014 literature review performed by uh, Iranian scientists looking at biomarkers of happiness, endogenic versus exogenic causes, and what their review indicated is that between 35 and 50 percent of biologically evident happiness may be attributable to genetics alone. I'm sure plenty of psychologists and other scientists would dispute the specifics, but I doubt any would challenge the core assertion that genetics play a really big role in a person's capacity to feel good. So that's problem number one you should anticipate with success. Your underlying predisposition toward one mood or another, toward one mode of behavior or another, that will not change. You can still make a hell out of a mansion up on Lion's View. And I guarantee you that someone up there is probably doing so right now. You can improve your behavior with hard work and with therapy, but nothing can buy you a new genome. Which leads us to uh, champagne problem number two. Money fixes so many problems, just not all of them. There's a, there's a famous 2018 study out of here in the U.S. It's from uh, Purdue University and uh, UVA. Psychologists here tried to find out how much money is enough to make you happy. And there are many similar such studies, but this one was remarkable in its scope. They looked at the whole world, and they naturally found that the level of annual income positively correlated with happiness varies considerably from place to place. Happiness is more expensive in Northern America than it is in Southeast Asia, for example. Specifically, it is $35,000 a year more expensive in Northern America compared to Southeast Asia, according to this particular study. This was a study of 1.7 million people worldwide. And so they're not looking at like biomarkers of happiness here. They did not collect 1.7 million urine samples so they could see how much adrenaline people are excreting. Rather, the data came from the Gallup World Poll. So we're talking about survey data here, like self-reported information. However, Good psychologists don't just ask people how happy they are and then take their word for it. They, they ask more detailed questions to try to suss out the truth. For example, this particular poll used what's called Cantrell's Self-Anchoring Striving Scale, where zero is your worst life and 10 is your best life. They ask you which rung of that ladder you think you're on. 
Other studies that have really dug a lot deeper into individual human subjects have found that responses on this particular scale do tend to be generally pretty accurate. The authors, authors of this paper also looked at what's called uh, affective well-being. They dug into people's answers on questions like, uh, you know, what kinds of experiences have you had lately? How did those experiences make you feel? Did you spend more time yesterday laughing or stressing out or being sad, that kind of thing? The researchers dug into all of those responses and compared people's apparent level of happiness to their level of income, and here's what they found. In Northern America, so US and Canada, you gotta make at least 105,000 US dollars a year to feel like you're living your best life. It's described in the paper as life evaluation satiation. And I guess I could describe that finding more precisely as once you make at least 105K a year, your income ceases to be a predictor of whether you feel like you're living your best life. You may feel like you're living your best life making way less money, making way more money, but these findings indicate that on average, 105K a year is the most money that can help you live your best life. After that, you're on your own. Money can get you pretty far toward happiness, but it can't get everyone all the way there. Just because I know people are curious, here's that uh, life evaluation, satiation, income level for some other regions of the world. It's 100,000 US dollars in Western Europe, 45,000 in Eastern Europe and the Balkans, 110K in East Asia, 115K in West Asia slash North Africa, 40K in Sub-Saharan Africa, and $35,000 a year in Latin America and the Caribbean. On the level of large regions of the globe, Latin Americans need the least amount of money to be happy, despite the fact that Latin America is not the poorest or cheapest part of the world. Latin Americans seem to need a lot less money to be happy relative to their cost of living. Why is a very interesting question that is the subject of ongoing scientific investigation. I'm not saying it's the food. I'm just saying it might be the food. Incidentally, my new band is called It Might Be Tacos. We're playing at the Outpost next weekend, no cover. That's a joke, I don't know who's playing at the Outpost, sorry. That's the money that it takes to live your best life. It takes a lot less money to feel basically not bad, to not feel scared all the time, to feel basically secure, to have the bottom of Maslow's pyramid on lockdown to have your food, your shelter, your physical security, that kind of thing. These same researchers put income numbers on what they call negative affect association. So this is, this is the maximum amount of money that people need to make a year that reliably predicts an absence of self-reported bad feelings, like lots of stress and sadness overwhelming everything else. In Northern America, that's $95,000 a year just to not feel bad. In Western Europe and Scandinavia, it's only 50,000 a year. Western Europeans and Americans need about the same amount of money to feel like they're living their best life, but Western Europeans need way less money to just not feel bad, to feel basically secure. An obvious explanation, supported by other research, would be the far more robust social welfare states in Western European countries. That's what higher taxes can buy you. Less fear for most people. I say this approvingly as someone who has recently started paying so much money in taxes. And it hurts too, let me tell you. It hurts because it's not like being withheld from my paycheck like it used to be. Right? Like, we, we have to sit down now and actually actively send hundreds of thousands of dollars to one government or another, and I fully support it, but it hurts. 
Oh, hey, sorry to interrupt, Adam. Adam here, just dropping in to say that, uh, you know, everything goes down better, even tax payments with some uh, delicious mixers from Shaker and Spoon, sponsor of this episode. I love cocktails so very much. They are such a source of enjoyment in my life, and Shaker and Spoon has helped me enjoy totally new drinks that I never would have made at home before, but I do now because they send me these uh, these boxes that have everything I need to make a whole bunch of really interesting cocktails. Shaker and Spoon is a monthly cocktail subscription box. Each box arrives with three original recipes created by world-class bartenders, recipes you cannot get anywhere else. The box comes with all of the mixers you need, the syrups, the, the bitters, the aromatics, the little fancy garnishes. All you need for each box is just one bottle of base liquor. You have that, you can make 12 drinks, four from each of the recipes. This uh, box is the Fruits of Fall box, and it's all based on uh, apple brandy, appropriately enough. And I am enjoying the Pear Necessities <laughs> brandy with uh, vanilla pear shrub, ginger beer, and garnished with some candied ginger. Let's try that. Mm. Oh, that's autumnal. I would never have all these little bits and bobs in my own little home bar situation, but... They send me just, you know, adorable little mini bottles of all the things that I need, and I just go to town. I, uh, I learn about new flavor combinations this way. I learn about new mixology techniques. I perform those techniques in accordance with some very easy-to-follow instructions. It's just the best. So click my link in the description, use code REGUSIA at checkout, or go to shakerandspoon.com slash REGUSIA for $20 off your first box. Get the the pair of necessities or whatever else they've dreamed up delivered right to your door and, uh, you know, have a party. Enjoy. Shakerandspoon.com slash Ragusia. That's in the description. Use my code Ragusia for $20 off your first box. Thank you, Shaker and Spoon. So anyway, I was uh, telling all the young people about how much money actually makes you happy according to, you know, science. My annual income has recently shot well above the point at which Money is a reliable predictor of any kind of happiness. Am I happy? Do I feel like I'm living my best life? Not totally, no. For reasons that we're gonna get to. It's great, great to not be afraid anymore. I spent so much of my life afraid about, uh, you know, my ability to make rent, my ability to pay off Sally Mae, my ability to not get fired from my job, my job that provides health care to my children because somebody in the United States thought that was a good system at some point. I hated being afraid, and I will never go back to the fear if I can avoid it, but that becomes its own kind of fear, leading me to champagne problem number three, loss of moderating external forces. Financial freedom is freedom, and with freedom comes responsibility. Responsibility to not act like a jerk, even though you can. For most of my adult life, if I acted like a jerk, there was a good chance that I would eventually lose my job. I'm sure there's a point at which I could behave badly enough now that my audience on YouTube would abandon me. But looking at the behavior of certain other YouTubers, I think I'm in no real danger of hitting that upper limit anytime soon. I have achieved what the kids these days, I'm told, call F.U. money, <laughs> though they don't normally express that with an initialism. When you have F.U. money, you can afford to speak your mind, to tell everybody what you really think of them. Does that sound like the dream to anybody here? Does it sound like the dream? Be honest. It's not. It's not the dream. Stop dreaming it. The few times in my life when I have exercised the rights and privileges afforded to me by FU money, whenever I have told people what I really think of them, I have immediately regretted it. Don't do that. It doesn't feel good. Live your truth, absolutely live your truth, but that's not the same thing as speaking your truth without any care for other people's feelings. In some cases, 
speaking my truth has hurt other people's feelings. And in some cases, I don't really care about their feelings because I do think that some of the people in question are garbage people. But I still think it was bad for me, it was bad for my soul, for lack of a better word, that I said what I said. And it was bad for the general civility within my society. For what it's worth, it's just funny that this mirrors my feelings on like a capital punishment, you know? Like I think that there are people in this world, a few people who, who deserve to die for their crimes, but I think that putting people to death diminishes us, the people making and executing the sentence, and therefore we shouldn't do it. Also, it's absurdly expensive to put people to death, and we convict innocent people all the time, and once you kill them, there's no way to make it right, and the whole system is super racist, so there are lots of other good reasons to not do capital punishment. Anyway, money. When you ask successful people about their regrets in life, they generally talk about how they treated other people. Because people whose lives turned out really well typically don't regret missing one opportunity or another. How can you regret that when your journey led you here and here is great? There were times when I regretted dropping out of grad school, for example, but like, not anymore. That was a stop on the path that got me here and here is great. I do regret how I treated other people. It's not all big things, like I regret interrupting someone else in a meeting so that I could get a chance to show everyone at the table how smart I am. Those are the kind of memories that uh, keep me awake at night. And that's the stuff I did before I even had FU money. When you win money, you lose external forces that moderate your behavior, and that means you have to work harder to moderate your behavior yourself. That includes being good to others, and it includes being good to yourself, not overworking yourself. My definition of success isn't just about money, it's about freedom. I work for myself. I can work as much or as little as I want, and I will be paid accordingly. The more videos that I put into the YouTube machine, the more money comes out. And the only limit on how much I can make is how much I'm willing to work, and apparently I'm willing to work way, way too much, as evidenced by the fact that I'm operating this camera while giving a speech. I don't work too much because I'm greedy. I'm not terribly greedy. I, I work too much because I'm scared. I'm afraid that something will happen, and I'll have to go back to being afraid again. Afraid about whether there's enough money in the account to cover that check that I just wrote, to pay the power bill, or whatever. I'm afraid of being afraid again. Sometimes I feel like I'm on one of those game shows where they lock you into like a plexiglass box with a wind machine and a bunch of paper currency flying around, and you get to keep whatever you can grab within 60 seconds, and I must look like a, a cat chasing a, a dangling toy. I, I'm scared that the money machine will stop blowing, which could happen. If you notice, my, uh, my eyes are watering a lot and I'm blinking a lot. It's because I cut my eyeball the other day. It was not a kitchen accident. No, that's what you're thinking. According to the doctor, I've got some kind of scar tissue on my right eye, perhaps from an old injury, and it kind of dried out in the night and I was sleeping and I... I blinked and my eyelid just kind of caught on the scar tissue and stuck to it because it was dry and it tore my eye open a little. Hurt real bad. And I couldn't even open my good eye. I had to keep them both shut because when you open one eye, the other eye moves with it, even if you keep the lid closed. And that was just agonizing pain. So I was blind for a day. Couldn't do anything that I normally do to make money. And this is not the kind of job where you can call in sick and they still pay you. This is different from other kinds of success where, say, you work really, really hard, you maybe earn an advanced degree, and then a large institution just pays you a generous, flat annual salary. That's what my brother does, Dr. Tony Ragusea. He's a psychologist up in Pennsylvania. 
He's on staff at a hospital, makes real good money. As long as he shows up and doesn't commit like egregious malpractice, he can probably count on having that income until he retires. That's Dr. Ragusea. I'm Mr. Ragusea. I make more money than Dr. Ragusea, which is really pretty profane when you think about it. Dr. Ragusea saves people's lives. Mr. Ragusea invents the recipe for crust pie. <laughs> Somehow the market assigned greater value to Mr. Ragusea's work. Explain that one. At least it assigns greater value to my work for now. I have no idea how much longer this con is going to run. So I rise and grind every day, and it is killing me. I'm not that happy. I'm not nearly as happy as I should be. I'm just so exhausted all the time. I have no external force moderating my naturally workaholic tendencies. The workday doesn't end. And that is bad. I have to learn to say no more. And so may you one day. You may also have your own employees one day. And side note, if you're ever mad because they don't work as hard as you do at the business that you own, remember that you work more because work is literally more rewarding for you, right? Nobody wants to work anymore, people say. Well, make work more rewarding, and I think people will want to do it. I'd rather have money than no money. I'd rather have freedom than no freedom. But the fact remains that there are particular things that are hard about having money and freedom. It's hard to make, it's hard to make decisions when you have money and freedom. Like, how should you pay your employees? That's a hard choice, made harder when lots of options are available to you. Fewer options can really be a blessing. You know what I'm talking about? Like, a giant menu at the restaurant is great, but like, clap if you'd rather see a small menu. Yeah, me too, I'm with you. I have a job where I could live anywhere in the world Anywhere I want, all, all I need is internet and light. Cost is a factor, so like, you know, maybe not every neighborhood in the world is open to me, but every city is, sure. Imagine yourself in the same situation. Like you have a job and an income that would allow you to live anywhere in the world. That, that's like a realistic scenario, right? Because I, I bet a lot of you already work jobs that you could kind of do from anywhere that has internet. Yeah? Where would you choose to live? Seriously, somebody like shout it out. Where would you choose to live if you could live and work anywhere? Yeah. I hear San Diego. What was that over here? Anna Maria Island. That sound, I don't know what that is, but it sounds beautiful. Maine. Maine. <laughs> don't play to the crowd, sir. <laughs> Say in Knoxville, Tennessee. You'll see what playing to the crowd gets you. I chose Knoxville, Tennessee. <laughs> True story. We could have chosen to live anywhere, and we chose here for a few reasons. It's very beautiful. Lots of architectural beauty, lots of natural beauty. I like mountains. I like rivers. I like trees. I like flowers. Got lots of those here. You got all four seasons here, but summers are long and winters are short. I really like that. Great public schools for the kids. Very big. Research University, a mile from the house. I've lived in college towns my entire life. It's, it's good to be around young people, and it's good to be around smart people. College towns have both, though they are not always the same people. <laughs> There's really no like big city amenity that we lack for here, and yet it feels something more manageable than a, than a big city. I spent a decade of my life dealing with Atlanta traffic, never again. And of course, we have family here. My wife, Lauren, grew up in uh, Blount County. So really, we asked ourselves, where in the whole world would we like to live where we also have family? And that narrowed the options considerably, and that was good. It narrowed the options considerably because no matter how much money you make, your family remains your family. This goes back to champagne problem number one. You remain yourself and yourself includes your family. You can't buy yourself a new family. 
Not that I would want to if I could. You remain yourself when you cross into the domain of champagne problems. But your relationship to everyone else changes, and that is champagne problem number four and final, social disorientation. I'm the same person, but I'm not the same person in relation to you. And I'm still getting used to that. I'm still reorienting myself, figuring out my, my new role in all of this. I can't complain about the state of the world as much as I used to. Like, who, who the hell is in charge here if not me? I'm in the 1%. The richest 1% of people in the whole world who run the whole world and have most of the money. That's me now, and that is terrifying. It's rather like an experience I had in my early 30s. I was sitting in the house one day. There was a knock on the door. I opened the door, and there were three kids holding a puppy. Hey, mister, you want this puppy? We found it near the dumpsters at our apartment complex, and we're not allowed to have dogs there. So you, you want a puppy, mister? And in that moment, I thought to myself, oh no, I'm the adult in this situation. <laughs> this puppy is my problem because I'm the grown up here. Whatever I was planning to do today has to stop because I have to find out who this puppy belongs to or find it a new home, which we did. We found it a new home. When you join the world's richest 1%, you acquire an ownership stake in the system. Whether you want that ownership stake or not. And when the system goes awry, you can't just say, somebody ought to do something about this. You ought to do something about this because it's your system, whether you want it to be or not. It is disorienting. You also just kind of forget sometimes that you don't have to be cheap anymore. Like, uh, I was booking a plane flight from Knoxville to Detroit the other day for a, for a shoot. It's going to be my first plane flight in a long time, and out of habit, I booked the worst possible flight. I, I think it was going to stop over in Toronto or something. No bags, no carry-ons included. Middle seat, back of the plane, where it smells weird. And Lauren, my wife, she like saw me booking this ticket. She looked over my shoulder at what I was doing on the laptop and she said, are you crazy? Just buy the good ticket. And what's crazy is the good ticket was only like $80 more. First class, what do you mean? my first time in my entire life flying first class is gonna be to the D to make a video about Detroit style pizza. pizza. It's like a $500 ticket. But the difference between the terrible flight and the great flight is only like 80 bucks. I never knew that. Uh, sorry, Adam. It's Adam again. You know, another situation where the good stuff is surprisingly affordable is uh, the Everyday Earbuds from Raycon, sponsor of this episode. Hopefully, they'll forgive me at Raycon for saying that I'm generally not a big fan of wireless audio. I always seem to have trouble syncing my devices together over Bluetooth, but I've never had one problem at all with my Raycon earbuds. You just put them in, you hold down the button to turn them on, open up the Bluetooth panel on your phone or whatever, and Raycons will appear, just click them, you're connected, and you only have to do that the first time. After that, it's, it's all automatic. I usually use uh, earbuds when I'm running, so the fit is really important to me. I cannot have my earbuds falling out in the middle of the road. The everyday earbuds come with a bunch of different sized, really soft, cushy gel tips. You just pick your perfect fit and they do not fall out. They feel really soft and comfortable in your ears too. They sound great, of course. You can also turn on noise cancellation just by holding down the, the button again. Uh, they call it the awareness mode. Turn that on and the headphones just cancel out to the ambient noise around you via the magic of phase cancellation, which we've, we've talked about on the podcast before. Great battery life too, uh, 32 hours, eight hours of playtime. And when it's time to charge, they snap magnetically into place in their little charging case. But the best part is you get all of that for half the price of other premium audio brands, half the price. So go to buyraycon.com today, use code ADAMR15 
to get 15% off your Raycon order. That's code ADAMR15 at buyraycon.com to score 15% off. Buyraycon.com, code ADAMR15. That's all in the description. Thank you, Raycon. So yeah, I was, uh, I was telling the young professionals about why I always used to uh, buy the worst, cheapest airplane ticket. Why have I been taking the terrible flight my whole life? It's because I'm frugal, which up until very recently was a virtue. I have to realize that now it's a vice. The same behavior isn't frugal anymore. It's stingy. Because there's lots of other people in the world who would like some of that money. Some of them may feel that they deserve it, and they might be right. So what do you do in this situation? Well, for one thing, my new, uh, my new baseline for tipping is 50%. I always used to t- tip at least 20%. Now I always tip at least 50%. Some of you may applaud this, but others of you are probably thinking, oh, 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 so I have to deliver a pizza to you to enjoy your largesse? I have to perform some menial act of service to get a tiny taste of your ill-gotten gains, you capitalist. Some of you were thinking that, don't lie. I would be. So Lauren and I have started having serious conversations about major and ongoing philanthropic commitments. But then we also have to learn that we're not Bill and Melinda Gates, not least because we are still married and like each other. But also, because like, we're in the 1%, but we're at the like very bottom of the 1%. When you're in the 99, all the 1% looks the same, right? But then you get in the 1% and you're like, oh, oh, no, it is not. It is not all the same. Our brains are not wired to comprehend exponential differences in numbers, right? Like four is twice as much as two. That's a big difference, but it's only a difference of two. Eight is twice as much as four, which sounds like the same difference, but it's actually a difference of four, not two. And keep going, and eventually you get into some incoherently huge numbers. Truth is, I'm not a master of the universe. I'm not in charge here. Bill Gates is in charge. Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Warren Buffett, Larry Page. Actually, no, not Larry Page. Larry Page owns Google, and Google owns YouTube. Larry Page is the best. (laughs) But all those other guys, they're they're the jerks in charge, not, not me. Don't blame me. But put me and my ridiculous YouTube income into a corrugated metal shack in a township outside of Cape Town or wherever and see if I make the same argument to the people in that room. So those are some of the champagne problems that await you, young professionals of Knoxville, Tennessee. I sincerely hope they await you because, oh, they are so much better than the other kinds of problems. I thank you for your attention, and I think we've got uh, time for a couple of questions. Just remember that uh, this is being recorded, so if you don't want to be on my YouTube channel, you know, don't say anything. So anybody got a question? You can just uh, stand up and shout it. I'll repeat it in the mic. Okay, uh, so the question is, um, you know, was cooking always your passion? And if so, did you ever feel that you would just kind of burn out on your passion when you turn your passion into your livelihood? And it's certainly the case that you know, work is work. No matter how great work is, it will start to feel like work, okay? Um, and things that you would have done for fun the other day, like you feel like, oh, I have to get out and do the fun thing again because it's work. Like, it's it just, that's the fact of life. It's the way it is. Um, I've always been interested in food and, and cooking, yes, it was, it was not always my main interest. Um, it was not where I thought I would end up, but you know, f- fame chooses you, you don't choose it. Um, and so here we are. And uh, do I get burned out? Uh, I get burned out in, in the sense that I'm working too much, but I've, I've, I've actually been able to avoid getting burned out on like thinking about food all the time because I, I was very fortunate to stumble into success on a topic like food that connects to like every other thing that's important about life on this planet, right? Um, So when I say I do food and food adjacent things, that basically opens up almost everything, you know? 
Um, and, and my audience, bless them, have been willing to kind of go there with me, even when the, the leap was not as obvious as it is on other, other weeks, you know? Um, and I, as I've been doing this more and more, I, you know, and they've been along with you for a long time, I can push a little bit more. And so I've been going further and further afield, and that's been, that's been keeping me interested, for sure. I mean, one thing, you know, I, I mentioned that I was a music major in school and, and grad school, uh, you know, composition. I was like a, you know, prodigious kid um, who burned out and disappointed everyone, you know, um, mostly myself, you know, but, uh, you know, part of the problem there was that it's just like I, I never, I could never focus on the thing that I needed to do, like, I just, because I was interested in lots, like, too many other things. It wasn't that I it was lazy, I was just sort of, you know, ha, ha, squirrel, right? Um, and, and I, and that made me bad at school, and I always thought it was a, a vice, but then I, like, stumbled, you know, bass backwards into the public radio station at Indiana University, and, you know, where, where all the misfit toys go, um, overeducated people with nothing to offer any place else in the world. And, and I started reporting, and I got a job where my job was to become interested in a new, totally different thing every day. And then forget about it, and then do it again the next day. And all of a sudden, this personality trait that was, I thought was a bad thing about me became an asset. And I, I've tried to remember that, to remember that like, you know, I, I am not broken, you are probably not broken, um, some of you may, I mean, some of you may, I mean, if you're, if you're like a serial killer, that's a bad thing. <laughs> Try not to be that, you know, but like short of that, like I'm pretty confident that you're not broken and there's like a, a place where your little puzzle piece fits, um, where, where you're not fighting who you are naturally, where you can just, who you are naturally is who they need there, you know, and I, I would encourage you to, to, to hold out and look for that because it's probably out there, especially in this insanely specialized economy that we're in. You know, I, I used to go around for Mercer recruiting undergraduate students and, you know, going to a lot of, um, you, know, uh, you know, schools with like, you know, 100% free and reduced lunch. That's the kind of student population talking about um, where we really wanted more, more kids and we were trying to develop talent. And I'd go there and like, I'd say, so what, you know, what do y'all want to do? And they would just say, I, you know, I want to be a nurse or a doctor. And it's not that they were all like had you know, healing as their passion. I think it's the, that's the jobs that they knew about. For you know, uh, those are the jobs they've seen. Those are jobs they've seen on TV. And I, what I always just tried to say was like, look, you know, just whatever vague subject area is most interesting to you, just just walk in that general direction. Because like the economy of today is such that like most of the jobs that y'all are going to have are things that might not even exist right now, and there's certainly things you've never heard of, right? Like, so just, just go, go walk in that direction, the direction that you feel pulled, and like, don't be a jerk to anyone, be the kind of person that people want to work with, and, you know, you, you will probably find your, your place, I hope. But I am also cognizant that that's a privileged perspective. So, there it is. Any other, oh, question over here, yeah? <laughs> yes, I, I will be your guest speaker at your public relations class at the University of Tennessee. Um, but the question was like, you know, can you, um, can you diversify in a job like this? Can you sell products? Can you sell merch? Can you sell books? Can you, can you get into other businesses and make more money that way? But also probably, you know, I think more significantly as implied by the question, uh, can you avoid burnout? Can you, can you do, just do different things? And I would say that, yes, you can do all of those things. Um, you know, uh, a, a much more famous food YouTuber named jo Joshua, Joshua Weissman um, has a, a cookbook that, like, you know, to topped the New York Times bestseller list. Um, and that, you know, that's, dude's making a lot of money from that, and that's great. Um, I would say that if I was younger, I would probably be exploring more such opportunities, right? Uh, I, I um, you know, but this, this happened to me in my late 30s, and I'm, I'm grateful for that every day because I can't imagine the, the psychological burden of the, of the attention and the, the stuff people say about you on the internet, you know, if this had happened to me when I was, you know, 27 or God forbid 17, you know? I don't know how people survive that, frankly. Um, so, I don't know, I'm, I'm old, 
and I don't want to work that much longer, so I kind of don't want to open up a whole lot of other doors. Like, I want to stop. Um, and I've sold merch and stuff, but I, I do it more as like kind of fan service because people want it, and you, you don't you don't make as much money from that stuff as you make from from the other stuff. And like being selling media is a really good job because you don't you don't have to like track packages. You don't have to deal with people. Like like there was a guy he's, he's in Michigan and he's like I I'm a developmentally disabled person. I love your 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 channel. Um, my, I ordered your chef's knife and it was stolen off the porch of my house. And I know you say you sold all of them, but like, is there anything you can do? And like, what, you know, what do you, what do you do? Like, you can't, you can't not figure out a solution there. So like, we found like one that had like a minor factory defect in it and we, we sent it to him and, and he was super grateful, but it's like I, and I was glad to do that, but I don't want to be doing that all the, all the time and multiply that times, you know, a thousand or a million, right? It's it's just that's just like a much harder job. Um, yeah, there's there's a reason why like you know like so I'm, I'm very interested in like fitness media too, and I've been sort of transitioning my channel there a little bit. My audience seems interested in fitness content, and like in the fitness world, there's a reason that all of the companies, you know, yeah, they'll sell you their little powders or their T-shirts or whatever, but what they really want to sell you is their workout plan PDF, right? Because that's a thing you make one time. And then all you do is like upload it and people download it. You, you do nothing else and you just watch the money come in. And if, you know, it's good work if you can get it. Uh, one more question, probably. We have time for one more question, do you think? We need one more. One more, okay. Um, uh, you were first, yeah. How do you balance your gratitude for what you have How do I balance my gratitude for what I have with my ambition for achieving more? Um, I do have a little ambition for achieving more, like, you know, it's, especially given that I was a reporter for so many years and I worked in nonprofit media for so many years, like I worked in public broadcasting, like I was, and, I, and that involves begging people for money all the time, like asking people for money to support what we do, and I suddenly find myself in a position where I can be the one who gives, not the one who begs, and that's, pr like, that's, that's really exciting, like, that's, like, wow, like, what, what could I do? What could I fund that no one else is funding? That's, like a, that's really tantalizing. Uh, and I think if I were a little younger or a little more ambitious, I would probably just, I would probably branch out and try to become like an empire and make a ton of money and then be like a, a social entrepreneur, you know, like fund companies that make the things that I want to see in the world. But I'm too old for that. Um, so one, one of you will have to do that. And I, you know, I have every confidence that at least at least one of y'all in here is going to do that. It's a big group of bright faces, and I've really appreciated getting to talk to you. So thank you very much. So there you go. Thanks to uh, Amanda O'Dell and everybody else at the Knoxville Chamber of Commerce for inviting me to come and talk at their thing. We'll get back to some of your questions on next week's pod. If you have something that you'd like for me to address, well, you can address me at askadamquestions at gmail. Please submit your question in the form of a video or audio file and uh, briefly describe the question in the, the subject or the message body, askadamquestions at gmail. I wish only the champagne problems for you, dear listener. Talk to you next time. Make good choices. <laughs>